Hello again everyone, this is Chris Ostrowski with Avout and in this video lesson we're going to take a look at fundamentals of web services. We're not going to get into the actual coding of web services here. As you're going to see, web services can be created in virtually any modern programming language that can understand what a web service is. In other videos specific to different languages like Oracle J Developer or Oracle Application Express, we'll actually walk through the steps of how to create a web service. In this video, we're just going to take a look at the fundamentals of web services, why they exist, what they can do for your organization. So, in IT, we have a couple of really challenging issues that go along with modern application development. Two of the main issues that IT is dealing with on a regular basis is the duplication of code and how to integrate different systems together. For the most part, most large organizations are made up of heterogeneous systems. And heterogeneous simply means that there are different types of systems, different hardware, different operating system, different databases. And avoiding the duplication of code and being able to integrate those systems together is one of the big challenges that's out there. So let's take a look at the first one. How can we eliminate or reduce the amount of code that we have to duplicate across systems as much as possible? Well, anytime we develop an application, there's usually three main parts to the application. There's the language we decide we're going to write it in, the operating system that we're going to deploy it on, and the data source. And in most organizations, the applications are completely different. So let's say application 1 is developed in Java. It's deployed on a Linux system. Whoops, sorry, Linux. And it uses Oracle as its data source. And then application 2 is written in C sharp. It's deployed on Windows, and the database is SQL Server. This is fairly common, fairly common thing that I see in a lot of organizations. For all intents and purposes, this isn't totally true across the board, but for all intents and purposes, application one and the combination of technologies that are used in application one, Java, Linux, and Oracle, whatever combination I use, I've pretty much isolated any other application from directly talking to any of the stack here. Now that's not true across the board. There are a lot of very complex and expensive integration tools that are available today. But for all intents and purposes, the application that I've developed here and all the code that goes behind the application is isolated to this platform, this Java platform running on Linux with an Oracle data source. Same is true for the second application here, the C-sharp C -sharp application that's running on Windows and is using SQL Server as, as its data source. Again, there are a lot of very expensive tools, a lot of very complex tools that allows you to integrate the different pieces here. But for all intents and purposes, these guys are, are pretty much isolated from one another. So I might have code inside my application one that's duplicated inside my application two. And as an example, I'm going to use something like a, a credit card check. So I'll just call it CC check. That checks credit cards. And maybe this little piece of code goes through and it takes the credit card number the uh, expiration date, um, and those will be the inputs. And the output will be the available credit.
Oops, sorry about that. The available credit. So if I have that code written inside my application one here in Java, and I want some other application to use that code, there's a bunch of things I can do. You know, I could put this into a library and then have the other applications try to get at this library, but there's a lot of issues that go along with doing something like that. There's security issues, there's performance issues, integration issues between these two different types of applications is, is very challenging. And for most organizations, what are they going to have to do? Well, they're going to have to duplicate this code. Whatever business logic is inside this credit card check procedure inside of Java, whether it's a method in Java, I'm probably going to have to duplicate all of that business functionality inside my C Sharp application also. So there's two rounds of testing, two rounds of specification, uh, different language parameters that go along with it. And then what happens when I want to make a change to the business logic and how I process credit cards? I have to update this in multiple locations. And that could really be a challenge. I have to make sure that all the requirements are specified exactly right. They're implemented. They're tested. Now I'm doing this on multiple platforms. And again, this is a real simple example. If I want to duplicate true business functionality amongst a bunch of different applications that have different languages, operating systems, and data sources, that could really be a challenge for me to do. The second main challenge that IT departments are facing is the integration between these two apps. Most organizations demand that they have access to all of the information inside their organization, and they want a consistent view of the organ, uh, a consistent view of the data with inside their organization also. So, what do most organizations do in this in this scenario, where they have you know different uh, languages, operating systems, and and data sources inside their organization? Well, a lot of times they'll set up a data warehouse. And they'll pull information from SQL Server. They'll pull information from the Oracle database. They'll massage the data, put it into their data warehouse. But there's a lot of challenges that go along with that also. Is the data consistent between the data sources? How is the data massaged? What are the rules that are set up for getting this information into the data warehouse? How often is the data warehouse updated? Is it updated monthly? Is it updated weekly? Is it updated daily? Do people know when they query information out of the data warehouse that they're not seeing up to the second information, that the information is maybe a week old or a month old or a day old or something like that? This really can spiral out of control pretty quickly within an organization. Not only are you maintaining two different applications on two different platforms, now you're maintaining the data load procedures, the extract transform and load procedures between these two different applications, getting them into a data warehouse, maintaining the data warehouse, making sure all of the rules are set up inside your data warehouse. Data warehouses are really pop, are, are really powerful, especially if they're set up properly. They can really give you an incredible insight into what your business is doing on a regular basis. But so many IT departments are struggling with the fact that they're spending so much time setting up their data warehouses or their data stores or their data silos, maintaining all that information, setting up the rules for all of that information, administering the database, making sure that the reporting that comes out of that database is accurate and everybody understands the context, that a lot of IT departments set up this uh, additional layer of data within their organization only to find that they're spending that much more time just maintaining the data layer and they're not focusing on their core applications, their core business anymore. So a couple of years ago, a new technology came out that aimed to simplify a lot of this stuff, and it was called Web Services. Let me just clear this here. And what makes Web Services so powerful is that they're based on standards. And these standards are not controlled by anybody. 
They're not controlled by Microsoft. They're not controlled by Apple. They're not controlled by Oracle. They're based on open standards. So once you create a web service and you expose the web service through a web browser, any application should be able to interface with that web service and get the information that it needs. What does that mean? Well, the platform that we mentioned earlier, the language, OS, and data source. This combination we don't really care about anymore. Since the web service is based on open standards, we don't particularly care if the application was written in C Sharp, if it was written in Java, if it was written in Visual Basic. As long as the language can understand and knows what a web service is, we can use any language that's available to us to create these web services. The operating system doesn't matter. Could be Linux, all of the different flavors of Linux that are out there. Whoops, I keep running Linus. All the different flavors of Linux that are out there, all the different flavors of Windows that are out there. We don't particularly care. Why? It's going to be the app server that's serving up the web services. So the app server could be something like Oracle's WebLogic, it could be Apache. We don't really care. These web servers are going to serve up the web service for us and then we're going to consume the web services using whatever language we want to. We can use C Sharp to consume it, we can use uh, Java to consume it, Visual Basic. Really exciting new functionality of Oracle Application Express, and I'm going to have a video on this real soon, is that we can now use Oracle Application Express to create and consume web services. So again, we don't care about the operating system. We also don't care about the data source. Could be Oracle, could be DB2, could be SQL Server. Doesn't matter to us. The web service hides all of this implement implementation details from the person who's actually consuming it. Same goes through after we create the web service and how we consume it. doesn't matter what language, doesn't matter what operating system, and again the web service is going to take care of the data source for us automatically so we don't really care about that. But as long as we're dealing with a development language that understands what a web service is and how to consume a web service, and virtually all modern programming languages do because again it's all based on standards, we should be able to use any of the web services that are out there, that are available, that are made available to us either within our organization or outside of our organization. So what are the standards that web services are based on? Well, there's three big ones. One is called XML. And XML is kind of the language that web services use to communicate with each other. And then there's two other ones called SOAP and REST. SOAP stands for Standard Object Access Protocol. REST stands for Representational State Transfer. SOAP is much more flexible. It gives you all of the capabilities of using web services. So you can do a web service to create just about anything. Represent representational State Transfer is an architectural design for a web service. It doesn't have everything that's available to us as part of a SOAP based web service, but it's a lot more easy to implement. SOAP is more complicated, but it's also more flexible. It's good for when you're doing things like asynchronous processing of uh, web services. So you might send a, a call off to a web service and then the program might continue on before it receives a response from the web service. And then it gets a response back from the web service and then create and then does something else. So SOAP is really good for that. It's also good for what are called stateful operations. And uh, we have other videos on web technologies if you don't understand the difference between stateful and stateless operations. REST is really good for when you have limited bandwidth, limited resources, and you can cache data. So REST is really good for database type access. 
And as a matter of fact, the Oracle Application Express implementation of web services uses the REST-based web services uh, architecture exclusively. You can't build a SOAP-based web service in Apex, but you can build a REST-based service in, in Apex. REST is really good for stateless communications. And the difference, again, between stateful and stateless operations, the best analogy I can think of is stateful is like a phone call. When you pick up your phone and you call somebody, you make the connection. The connection is maintained even if you're not saying anything. Even if, you're, if both of you are silent on the phone and no communication is going back and forth, the connection is maintained. This is really good for quick transfer of information, but there are resources involved that, that are involved in, in maintaining that connection. Like I said, even if uh, no communication is going back and forth. Rest is like sending a text to somebody. The connection isn't maintained all the time. You send a text, it kind of goes off to wherever, and then you continue on either using your phone or whatever text messaging system you're talking about. There's not a connection that's maintained there the whole time. So it's a lot more reliable because the connection doesn't have to be maintained all the time, but the passing back and forth of information isn't instantaneous. So there's benefits to using each one of these different types of technologies. And like I said, REST is really good for database type operations, and that's what Application Express uses. In the different videos that I've created for Oracle specific projects like Oracle J Developer and Oracle Application Express, I get into the details of how to create and use web services in each one of those technologies. Hopefully this video has given you a really good background on how web services can really help your organization.